Good afternoon. And I do note among some of our overseas viewers, I probably need to say good evening. I'm Bob McConnell, Director of External Affairs for the U.S. Ukraine Foundation's Friends of Ukraine Network, serving as your host today. I'm anxious to hear today's discussion, so I'll introduce our discussants quickly so we can get into the discussion. To introduce Paul Goebel as a former special advisor to the Secretary of State and a former senior advisor to the Director of Voice of America is to minimize who he is and the contrib contributions he has and is making in the realm of understanding international dynamics. He is a specialist on ethnic and religious questions in Eurasia. He served in various capacities at state and central intelligence agency, international broadcasting. But those who try and keep up with his writings about the complex and critical dynamics within the Russian Federation appreciate just how fortunate we are to have Paul with us this morning to discuss how Putin's oppression inside Russia and his aggression against Ukraine are intertwined. We are also fortunate to have David Kramer with us to discuss this topic with Paul. David has just started his new position as Managing Director for Global Policy at the George W. Bush Institute. Before that, among many other things, we knew David as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, President of the Freedom House, and more recently, David was teaching at Florida International University. With that, Paul, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Bob. That's very generous of you. On a day when Russian troops are massed along the Ukrainian border and inside parts of Ukraine already occupied uh, by Russia, it may seem precious to be talking only about the issue of the relation of domestic and foreign policy in the Russian Federation. But it seems to me that unless we understand that connection, we're not going to be in a position to make sure that Russia is defeated in its effort to restore some kind of imperial state around Moscow. I say that because of the uh, experience that I and many others had during the Cold War. During that Cold War, during that period, it was an article of faith among most people that the domestic policies of a regime are necessarily connected with the foreign policies, that the communists had a repressive policy at home and an aggressive policy abroad, and that those two were interrelated. This was sometimes uh, reduced to the slogan that democracies don't go to war against other democracies. And therefore, it was, it was viewed as desirable that we extend democracy to as many countries as possible, because that would, in the eyes of most people, lead to a situation in which there would be, it would be less likely that there would be military conflicts. And we had a situation where that, that view had a situation where within Western countries and the United States in particular, it led to a alliance, unfortunately lost, that made the successful prosecution of the Cold War possible. That alliance was between those committed to human rights and freedom on the one hand, and big business interests, not only because the big businesses recognized that communism was a threat to their, their ability to make profit, but that they would be charged with being soft on communism if they tried to invest too heavily in communist countries. And so it meant that the concerns of human rights and democracy activists received far more attention and support within Western governments than would otherwise have been the case. We have seen that in 1989 and 1991, that alliance broke down. And it, because it broke down, it's important to understand how and why uh, that occurred and what it means for us. Because it now became possible for business interests to be involved in many countries, including the Russian Federation, which we foolishly proclaimed a democracy before it became one, 
we now have a situation where the Kremlin has an, uh, an undoubted advantage in preventing the active opposition to its aggression because many business interests have, an, have, a, have a desire to make money, to make profit by investing inside the Russian Federation. And they inevitably lead, resist uh, the expansion of a sanctions regime that will hit Western interests too. I mean, one of the things whenever anyone proposes sanctions anymore, immediately there is a discussion, how will it hurt us? How will it hurt our businesses? Because there is so much mo Russian money in the West and so many possibilities for people in the West to make money off of that money that there's a great reluctance to stand up against them. Had we not ha had we still had the alliance of nineteen of pre nineteen eighty nine United States, we would have been able to impose far more sweeping sanctions uh, in two thousand fourteen. We wouldn't have to be worried about only doing it now when the Russian army seems posed to at least seize Odessa, because I think it's going to head to the south uh, first to seize the area, the land bridge to Crimea, which some people in this country unfortunately will defend. And it would mean that we would be carrying the struggle against Russian actions in Ukraine into Russia itself, where our opposition to Russian aggression would also be an opposition to Russian repression at home, which is now much worse than it was at any time in the latter part of Soviet history. It is increasingly reminded us of a pre-1953 Russia. As a result, the separation of these two groups, the human rights democracy fraternity on the one hand and business interests on the other, there has also been a separation in the ideas of how we promote things. In other words, we're the, the democratic and human rights activists are concerned increasingly about the violations of human rights rather than about the sources of the violations of those rights. And foreign policy is viewed in the West as being about sanctions, about sanctioning and affecting the economy of the other side rather than affecting the political system. I think it should be common ground that economics and politics are deeply intertwined and that we cannot simply count on attacking economic tar targets without being concerned about the political ones. Otherwise, we will, see, we will see a situation like we have today where uh, Russia can absorb these sanctions and continue to do what it wants at home and abroad precisely because they are not deep enough and sweeping enough and are not combined, and this is my point, are not combined with an effort to pr promote democracy and freedom within the Russian Federation. We give some lip service to that, but we do nothing like what we did during the Cold War to fight communism in terms of our support for democratic and uh, national activists. Uh, and that's something that we're paying for now. The Russian government and Vladimir Putin personally are very aware of this situation and they are regularly exploiting it. And so they, can, they, 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 they feel that as long as their autocracy at home is not under active attack by the West, they can pursue their foreign policy of aggression with confidence that they will not face the kind of resistance they would face if they, if they had a more democratic system. If Russia had really become a law-based democratic system, it would not be invading Ukraine. And yet, because we, did, we put our stress on making it a free market and proclaimed it a democracy when it wasn't, we now have a situation where it is increasingly impressive at home, increasingly undemocratic, and increasingly aggressive toward Ukraine and its other neighbors. Well, what can be done? Well, first of all, it seems to me, we need to recognize what's going on. We need to recognize that, in, that if Russia becomes more aggressive, more uh, repressive at home, it will become more aggressive abroad. And if it becomes more aggressive abroad, it will become more repressive at home. Because it's not clear that the Russian people back what Putin is doing but they are controlled by his police state. 
And we need to recognize that reality. Unfortunately, there's little discussion of that within the discussion of, well, how many, how many sanctions should we impose and how many stingers should we send? Second, second thing we need to recognize, and this is even harder, it seems to me, for most Americans. The, Cold War, the first Cold War was in many ways a far more orderly arrangement because it was an intramural struggle between two modernizing ideas, the modernizing idea of liberal democracy and the modern idea of communism. Both were future oriented. What we have today is a world where the West represents, especially the United States, a future uh, view of the world. But in Russia, what we see is a country and a leadership that is committed to returning to a world, not just pre-1953, but pre-1914 a world where there are no, no real alliances to contain anyone, where uh, the use of force is legitimate, where that is the ultimate ratio for actions by governments, and where there is a demand from Moscow that that be uh, respected and accepted, and that many in the West are assuming that they have no choice but to behave in the same way, although they are constrained as Putin is not by fears of nuclear war. And third, and this is what I very much hope will happen, we need to restore, with, with those two understandings, we need to restore the union of the human rights and democracy activists and of the business community in Western countries that made possible the victory of the West in the first Cold War. We can do that, I think, more easily than many suspect, but we will have to pay some costs and people will have to absorb some losses. But the only way we are going to succeed in defeating Russian aggression abroad, such as we're currently watching in Ukraine, is to take the battle back into Russia itself. And that is to change Russia itself so that Russia will not want to invade anybody else, but will want to take care of its own people and focus on their betterment. What does that mean? Well, it means you expand Western broadcasting, you expand the internet, you create direct to home satellite TV channels, and you make sure that every Russian who dies in fighting Ukrainians, his name is broadcast and what, what he was doing is broadcast to everyone in the Russian Federation. We have the capacity to do that. It means you expand exchanges because the more people in Russia who come to the West and see what's going on, go home and they want less and less of what Vladimir Putin has to offer. We need to support the human rights community inside Russia, the national and regional movements. We need to be sure that we are in, we are in contact with those people, but we also need to know that trading with cannibals, as people said in the past, is not an appropriate strategy uh, for the United States. Creating an alliance of democracies, as President Biden tried to do earlier uh, this year, or at the end of last year, in many ways represents a good impulse. But the problem, of course, is who's in and who's not. There are always going to be questions about the people you need who are not democratic, as opposed to the ones that are democratic, but you don't really need. It seems to me that in the Cold War, making the distinction between communists and everybody else was pretty easy. Now we have to face the fact that we are in a Cold War that's not about communism versus anti-communism, but about those who are committed to law-based states and democracy and free markets, and those who are controlled to illegality, to the use of force, and to corruption of a scale unimaginable in any previous time in history. Defeating aggressiveness then it seems to me has to be recognized that the source, the, the place to defeat that aggressiveness is not just on the battle lines, not just in sanctions, but rather in defeating the, the repressiveness inside the Russian Federation that, um, that is feeding its aggressiveness abroad. Is that going to be easy? Is that going to be, come quickly? No, it's something that we're going to have to make a long time commitment. When George Kennan wrote his long telegram, he didn't expect that containment would win the day in a, in a year or two.
he had a much longer time horizon. <laughs> we need to have a similarly long time horizon. Defeating this kind of Russian revanchism and aggressiveness abroad is going to take us a long time because transforming the Russian society is going to take a long time as well. The reason I'm an optimist about this is because I read every day Russian people speaking out about what they want. And what they want and what Vladimir Putin and his regime want are not necessarily the same thing. There are an awful lot of Russians who don't want to go to war in Ukraine. There are an even greater number of Russians who don't want to go to war in Ukraine allied with Alexander Lukashenko of Belarus. And yet that's precisely what uh, Putin is proposing to do. We need to understand how we won last time, and we need to revive those te the techniques that helped us win. And if we, if we, if we don't, and with this I'll end, if we don't, I'll end with a warning. If we cease to try to combine or to open the battlefield away from the front lines of military confrontation and take it into the Russian Federation itself and to push for the transformation of Russia toward a more democratic and less repressive place, then in 5, 10, 15, or 20 years, even if we win this round, others younger than we will be talking about how to prosecute Cold War III, because we will see a recrudescence of the same problems that we saw 40 years ago, we're seeing now, and unfortunately could come back again. Thank you. Wow, a lot to think about. David? Uh, Bob, thanks very much. Thanks for having me. It's great to uh, be with Paul for this, this session. Um, I'm trying to figure out what I would disagree with and what Paul said, um, but so maybe let me try to present it a, a, in a slightly different way, but I, I don't think there's much daylight between the two of us. The way regimes treat their own people is often indicative of how they behave in foreign policy, and that is especially true in the case of the Putin regime, where we saw Putin when he first came on, remember how he came into power, through a brutal campaign against uh, Chechens um, in which there was indiscriminate force used against people that led to the killing of thousands and thousands of people. And that unfortunately turned out to have been popular in Russia that propelled him from being prime minister to acting president to president in 2000. Uh, then he quickly took over control of two if you will, independent, for lack of a better term, TV stations, so that he could control the narrative in Russia, the way most Russians, at least back then, got their news and information via TV. And from there, we have seen a further consolidation of power in Russia that has included an ugly crackdown on human rights, as Paul said, now really the worst we have seen in Russia in the past 30 years. But uh, sprinkled throughout, unfortunately, have been uh, more murders of journalists, of opposition figures, civil society activists. And this is, I think, characteristic of the kind of regime we see in Moscow, which is to deal with any perceived threat, whether real or not, in the most brutal way possible, while pretending to go through the motions of democratic systems, such as, quote unquote, elections or, or a, uh, a, a plebiscite that, that was also rigged to enable Putin to potentially stay in power until 2036. And so when we see this kind of treatment by the Russian regime of its own people, we shouldn't be shocked when we see Putin order forces to launch a cyber attack against Estonia with efforts to launch provocations in that country in 2007. We shouldn't be shocked when Russian forces invade Georgia in 2008, when they uh, invade Ukraine in 2014, when they uh, launch a military intervention into Syria in 2015 to prop up a murderous leader in Bashar al-Assad, uh, when they come to the rescue of other authoritarian leaders around the world. Um, it, not most recently, uh, Kazakhstan is a little more complicated, but in the case of Kazakhstan. But behind all of this is an effort to snuff out popular movements 
that could lead to the end of corrupt authoritarian leaders in these other countries. Uh, Putin does, does simply not believe that people in these countries have agency, that they themselves are capable on their own to demand better from their leaders and to demand a better way for the future. Um, he, he obviously denies that that exists in Russia. Remember famously in 2000, December 2011 with the protests after the rigged Duma elections, he claimed that then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had given the signal um, to Russians to turn out into the streets. He, he can't accept that Russians, to say nothing of Ukrainians or Georgians or Kyrgyz or anyone else, might actually be capable on their own of saying enough is enough. We don't like the path on which we are traveling and we want something better. And so uh, he then tries to portray the West, the, the international community, but in particular NATO, uh, particularly the United States, but even the EU as external threats to Russia, that Russia is being surrounded by these forces. And remember in 2013, when he pressured then pro-Russian uh, president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, not to sign the agreements. Those were agreements with the EU, not with NATO. In 2010, Yanukovych signed legislation uh, making Ukraine a non-aligned state, uh, reversing the efforts of the previous government in Ukraine to pursue a, a membership action plan, even membership in NATO. Ukraine in 2013-2014 in was officially a neutral state. And yet Putin decided that any agreements with the European Union would be a threat to his control over his so-called sphere of influence along Russia's borders. And so any outside organization effort that seeks to deepen ties, and, and let's be clear, these organizations deepen ties with these countries, not because the EU or NATO are trying to force themselves onto these other countries, it's because these other countries want to join the EU and NATO. It's a sense of belonging. It's also a sense of protection. Uh, the Baltic states, I think, certainly felt this way early on about the possibility of a renewed Russian threat. Um, and so NATO membership has been critically important for a number of these countries with Article 5 security guarantees. EU membership means being able to trade and interact with uh, the EU, which is an incredibly powerful uh, entity in its own right. And again, to be clear, these countries seek membership and seek joining these Euro-Atlantic institutions, not that these Euro-Atlantic institutions are seeking to impose their way on these other countries. For Putin, that is a threat. He worries that a successful, democratic, vibrant Ukraine that moves closer with integration toward the Euro-Atlantic community could be a threat to his grip on power in Russia. And so I would argue, contrary to what the Biden administration has claimed as its objectives of a predictable and stable relationship with Russia, Putin, in fact, wants the exact opposite. He seeks to destabilize his neighbors. He seeks instability so that these countries along Russia's borders become unattractive and unappealing to your Atlantic institutions. He is interested, I think, in, in uh, trying to establish a sense of control without full responsibility. I don't think he wants to take on responsibility for running these countries. He's discovered already that the illegal annexation of Crimea has been rather costly. And yet, if you look at what should be Russia's national interest, uh, Russia's national interest should want vibrant democratic countries along its borders, but that isn't what Putin wants. And so here I would argue that there is a divergence between what would ordinarily be seen as Russia's national interest in what are Putin's personal interests, because after all, let's remember, Putin's number one goal is to stay in power. His number two goal is to stay in power. And guess what his number three goal is? It's to stay in power. And so he'll do whatever is necessary to achieve that goal. But along the way, he is willing to destabilize his neighbors, uh, commit aggression and, and crimes, including alleged war crimes in the case of Syria. I think one could make a case for similar accusations in the case of Crimeans and others in Ukraine, um, but he's willing to engage in this behavior if he thinks it will enable him to stay in power. The other objective I think he, he believes is important, uh, again, to, to uh, facilitate his, his staying in power is to sow divisions in the West, to sow divisions within Europe itself, to sow divisions between Europe and the United States, 
and I dare say even to sow divisions within Washington, within the Biden administration itself, where it does, at least from, from where I sit here in Miami, um, appear to be differences between the National Security Council and the State Department on the best way forward. Um, Paul, Paul mentioned that uh, Putin is not really addressing the problems that Russia really faces. It, it's now experiencing the real wave of Omicron in the country with a very low vaccination rate, much lower than here in the United States. Uh, the economy has been stagnant and Putin has no vision for solving any of Russia's pressing domestic problems. Instead, he would rather play dangerous games uh, with his, his neighbors. Um, and so I, I do sense that there is, and Paul mentioned this with, with the, the authors he's seen writing articles, growing disenchantment with Putin. His numbers have dropped. They're still fairly high compared to Western leaders, but we also have to remember um, there have to be a lot of caveats issued when we look at polls in Russia. It is a very difficult place in which to conduct surveys because of paranoia uh, that, that exists among, among respondents. Um, last thing I'll say um, and, then, and then open it up is um, I, I agree with Paul's approach that, that if we don't address the root of the problem, the root of the problem is the rotten nature of the regime in Moscow, the, the kleptocratic authoritarian nature of the Putin regime, then the rest of what we will do will be kind of putting band-aids on wounds. Um, I, 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 there's a lot of, of work, a lot of very good work, in fact, done on the problem of disinformation. Um, but we don't have problems coming from our fellow democracies in Canada or the UK, Germany or France with disinformation. These come from authoritarian regimes who mean us harm. Um, if you look at the ransomware attacks that have come from Russia, they have been against a major pipeline in the United States. They have been against a uh, major meat uh, processing facility. Uh, and they have been against hospitals in the United States in the middle of a deadly pandemic. Our allies don't do this. These come from our enemies, um, from threats that exist in Moscow with the Putin regime. Um, and unless we recognize that problem, I don't think we will be able to, to address uh, the, the deterioration that we're seeing right now uh, with the situation between Russia and Ukraine or any other problem that exists between us. The last thing I'll say is the U.S. Embassy um, has been uh, significantly downsized, forced in this direction by Russian officials. A number I heard yesterday is 147 people with I think more than a dozen scheduled to depart by the end of this month. It is very difficult for us to operate in Russia with such a small staff. Um, our, our consulates elsewhere have been closed down, forced, uh, ordered by the Russians or because we simply didn't have the staff to maintain them. Um, I really would love to see more exchanges. The problem there is that the Russians essentially have blocked them. Um, and it's hard for a US embassy with such a small staff to process visas. I, I too would welcome the opportunity for more Russians to come here, but it will be increasingly difficult if we can't even address these basic fundamental diplomatic problems. Um, and by diplomatic, I mean at, at the bilateral relations level uh, and without, without assessing, without addressing these problems. So yes, I, I think the title of this, of this talk is very good. These issues are very intertwined um, and we shouldn't be surprised that we have all these problems given the nature of the Putin regime in Moscow. So let me stop there. Thanks. Well, thank you, David. I mean, um, I'd like to have the two of you go back and forth. This may not be all that uh, insightful, but I do raise, Paul, you were talking about, you know, reaching, like, essentially reaching into the, to the Russian people, the people of Russia and, and carrying, carrying the, uh, the war, if you will, advisedly using that word, uh, to them. One of the things that uh, the Friends of Ukraine Network emergency recommendations um, put out in December talked about was the information uh, campaign disinformation. But one of the things was that at this, at this time, Voice of America only has one Russian speaking reporter inside reporting from Ukraine, uh, almost leaving wide open all the Russian speakers in Ukraine and in Russia 
uh, to the Russian media. Uh, and I've had friends at the State Department saying, you know, if that we sit there and we have this Russian media on all day long, and we know it's all phony. But by the end of the day, we have to go read some other things to because we've been partially brainwashed all day. Uh, is one of the things we should be doing is ratcheting up, you know, the our old um, broadcasting to get truth into Russian speakers in Ukraine and Russia. Beyond any beyond any doubt, I just I would just urge that we think about the population. Uh, one just to give you a recent example of how we're falling into the trap of not dealing with the population having agency. When the riots occurred in Kazakhstan, the discussion in Washington was who was behind them, not what were the people in the streets demanding. It became a discussion of, is this being Tokayev or Nazarbayev or Moscow or China? It did not become a discussion of what did the Kazakh people actually want. The unfortunate tendency to shift from populations to elites is something we fall victim of increasingly. But with respect to get reaching people out, of course we should be broadcasting more. We should be putting more uh, attention into a variety of linguistic areas uh, around the world. I certainly would like to see a lot more Russian speaking uh, VOA and RFERL uh, personnel on the ground in Ukraine, but not just there, lots of other places. And I think we have to recognize there's something else. Many, many people have bought into the idea, Putin has, but so many Americans have too, that if people speak Russian, they somehow are Russian, which is utter nonsense. Large swaths of the population in Belarus and Ukraine speak Russian, but they are Belarusian nationalists and Ukrainian nationalists. I mean, the, the Soviet Union was predicated on the idea if we can just get everyone to speak Russian, they'll become Russians and we'll have a unified society. Well, the people who thought that, as I wrote, 35 years ago, were profoundly wrong because the people who learned Russian to be within, to, to play a game within the system were often the most serious opponents of that system. We've forgotten that the Irish didn't revolt against British imperialism when they were speaking Gaelic. They revolted against British imperialism when they were speaking English. And the British empire was not threatened by Hindi speaking peasants, it was tr threatened by English, English speaking lawyers like Gandhi. We have got to break free of an awful lot of concepts, which we find it easy to fall into, to, to accept, that are coming from Moscow in many cases, and that we don't escape. And the, the, the contempt, I think, to, to use no, no, more, no stronger word, that many people feel for the population, the contempt that Putin clearly feels for the population is unfortunately shared by many of the people who are doing analyses of these places. People matter. I think the Soviet Union died in 1991, not as a result of some conspiracy or some backroom deal by Gorbachev. It died because the Russian people, and, and I say Russian in the ethnic sense and not just in the in the political sense, the Russian people no longer wanted to be imperialists. They saw that that was costing too much. And that was what brought it down. We need to get away from worrying only about the elites and we need to start focusing back on the people. And we need to understand that there's a lot of information out there that isn't being mined, that can easily be mined and sent back in and magnified by broadcasting. Uh, place There are lots of people writing interesting things, saying what Russians think that we're not picking up and broadcasting back in the way we used to try to do, at least, at RFERL and at uh, the Voice of America. We can do that again, and we should be. That's one of the, one of the best ways to reach people.
I will point out we have a few questions here from listeners. Uh, one is, can we really be sure if Russia was properly democratic that it would become less aggressive internationally? Some Russian analysts argue that many R Russians are very nationalistic and that to some extent Putin is merely reflecting that nationalism. Um, he, the same person also asks, is another Cold War necessarily a bad outcome so long as it does not become hot? Well, those are two good questions. I, I would argue that uh, uh, opposing bad things is a good thing to do. Um, and that uh, opposing nuclear war is a good thing to do, but also opposing people who are prepared to constantly bring us to the, to the brink. And the, the issue of the, uh, what the Russian people want, uh, they'd like to have a cure or, or they'd like to have the pandemic addressed. They'd like to have hospitals reopen rather than closed the way Vladimir Putin has done. They'd like to have highways that are effective. Russia remains a country that you can't drive from one end to the other. You simply, there are no roads in large parts of the country. There are lots of things Russians would like to have. And if they have the chance to express their view in, the, in a democratic format, they, can, they will try to take care of themselves first. Does that preclude aggressive behavior abroad? No, democracies do go to war, but they go to war a lot less often than authoritarian states do because democracies have to answer the population's demands that it be taken care of first. And sometimes that can be ignored for a little bit, but not forever, as we Americans have had good reason to learn over the last 50 years. Another question is, um, on December 9th, Russians, uh, Russia's deputy foreign minister likened what is happening in Ukraine to the Cuban crisis in 1962. Isn't it possible that Putin and Russia do look at Ukraine's efforts to join NATO following on Poland and Hungary's membership the same way we looked at the USSR's placing, placing of nukes in Cuba? Well, I'm not surprised that a Moscow diplomat would say that because it plays exactly into the way Americans are inclined to think. But please remember what the Cuban Missile Crisis was about. The Cuban Missile Crisis was not about the question of the government in Cuba that came to power with Fidel Castro because of popular unhappiness with the Batista dictatorship. It was about the efforts of the, of the uh, Soviet Union to put missiles in Cuba. There's a big difference between the Ukrainian people wanting to be able to live their own life and make choices about whom they will form alliances and cooperate with, and a dictatorship as the Soviet Union was, putting missiles 90 miles off the shore of Florida. I, I think the analogy with the Cuban Missile Crisis works perfectly for Russian intentions, but doesn't explain the, doesn't describe the situation very well. And if I could just add, keep in mind that um, Ukraine was slow to request a membership action plan. Uh, its request came in January 2008. I was in the State Department at the time. And there was very little support among the Ukrainian population for pursuing membership in NATO. And that low rating continued for years and years until, not surprisingly, 2014, when Mr. Putin invaded Ukraine. And then what happened? Support for joining NATO didn't go through the roof, but has risen to about 60%, give or take, depending on the survey that's done. And it shouldn't surprise us that Putin's actions and tactics have backfired. He's actually increased the desire among Ukrainians to seek the security and safety and stability that comes with being a member of NATO with Article 5 security guarantees. And so again, it, it, I, I've argued for a long time, I think Putin's understanding of his neighbors is terrible. Um, I don't think he understands people who live along Russia's borders well at all. I actually think he understands Americans a little better than he understands those closest geographically to Russia. Um, but he has alienated populations along Russia's borders for years and has, uh, I think even in the case of Belarus, for example, uh, 
where no one's talking about NATO membership, not even EU membership, but took a population that was arguably neutral and maybe even some favorably disposed toward Moscow and alienated most of the population through its support for the Lukashenko regime. Um, and, and so I think we see this pattern over and over where the, the Kremlin uh, runs the risk of turning these populations into an anti-Russian uh, sentiment as opposed to trying to win them over uh, that I think, is, as Paul was indicating, could be done through a more democratic means of government. Um, I'm going to go to a question here, but first I'm just going to make a comment that uh, both of you have heard me say before. Back in the early days, before Ukraine's independence and immediately after, one of the things that Ivan Drach and Mikhailo Hodern uh, made sure that Rook did, they never spoke of Ukrainians. They spoke of the people of Ukraine because there were so many varied ethnic groups in Ukraine and, and Rook was, had all such members. A question we have is, don't you think that having more Russian speaking Western journalists in Ukraine using Russian to communicate with the population will only promote Russification of Ukraine? I think there, the first thing to remember is there's a huge difference between Russianization and Russification. Everyone who speaks Russian is not necessarily being Russified by that. I remember when I was studying Russian back in the middle of the Cold War, people sometimes thought if you were studying Russian, you must be a communist. No, you often studied Russian because you wanted to fight communism. Um, so I think that uh, we ought to have as many or more journalists uh, in Kiev and elsewhere in Ukraine who speak Ukrainian. I would, be, I would welcome the day when the vast majority of Americans at the embassy in Kiev speak Ukrainian first, uh, rather than in many cases speaking Russian. Uh, I think that it's very important to speak Ukrainian, but I think it's terribly important to reach, reach people who speak Russian too in Ukraine, if we didn't try to reach Russians in Belarus, we would be, we would have much less influence and the Belarusian people would have had a much more difficult time moving away from Moscow than they have. And, you know, I just add one thing, Bob, um, my, my biggest concern with, with Western journalists covering the situation is most of them are based in Moscow. There are very few based in, in Kiev. So, I would like to see a beefing up of the presence. These are uh, put aside VOA and RFERL, but these are uh, uh, journalists who work for private media enterprises. Um, so I'm a little less concerned about which language our Western journalists speak than uh, their writing stories about Ukraine from Moscow. Um, I'd rather they were in the country itself uh, to get a truer Ukrainian perspective on things than having it filtered through through Russia. People in people in the non-Russian countries around Russia often say about the Moscow centric and Moscow based Western journalists that, of course, it's possible to cover, cover Israel from Damascus, but it would be wrong. <laughs> and the same thing is true about anyone based in Moscow who is who is covering Kazakhstan, Armenia or Ukraine. Uh, we need vastly more journalists out there who are covering those countries from those countries. Uh, and the, the language is less important, but it is not unimportant sure. in terms of how, how we reach out. Uh, the, the, the contraction of coverage so that you've got fewer and fewer journalists in Moscow than you had 30 years ago, and the numbers in the non-Russian countries are microscopically small. Uh, it's, it's, we, would, we would protest instantly if uh, problems in Northern Ireland were being covered only by people in London. We would be upset if uh, somebody were covering Israel only from Jordan or Syria. But we don't seem to have a great deal of difficulty accepting a reality where most of the coverage of Ukraine comes from people based in Moscow and often looking at Ukraine with a Ukraine with a Russian uh, through a Russian lens. That's a serious, serious problem. Uh, 
I, I think it, it's important that people know, learn the languages of these countries, but I think it's also important that they live there if they're going to cover them. And that's uh, unfortunately no longer the case or, or was never the case. I mean, can I just add one other quick thing? Um, RFERL, is, uh, as I think everyone knows, is under tremendous attack in Russia. Uh, it's racked up, uh, I think it's approaching $15 million in fines. Um, most, if not all of its journalists who are based there are facing tremendous pressure. Um, I really think that that issue is getting lost amid the focus, understandable focus on the situation with Ukraine. But um, this is a US funded entity um, that provides indispensable reporting from the region. And I think we have to do a much better job of defending it, supporting it, and, and taking steps that would retaliate against RT and Sputnik um, that seem to run fairly free in this country. Thank you. You're here. I've got, I have a question here from somebody that I, I cannot let not be asked, um, Nadia. Uh, and, and it's driven, I'm sure, by the fact that she reads Paul's weekly or biweekly uh, uh, emails, as do I. Paul, can you talk about the dynamics between Russians and non-Russians within Russia itself? Well, the relationship between the roughly three quarters of the population, which is ethnic Russian, at least from the point of view of the state, and the 25% who are non-Russian as defined by uh, the nationality divisions is incredibly varied. Some of the non-Russians are uh, not unhappy to be part of a larger country because they see opportunities therefrom. Others would love to be independent. Almost all of them would like to have more autonomy, but in that they are, they are desirous of the autonomy that is equally strongly felt in predominantly ethnic Russian oblasts and cries. We talked about this, the Soviet Union and its, its disintegration largely in terms of the nationality question. I think the challenge for Russia in the future is really regionalism, not nationalism. The national movements that are, are there have been marginalized uh, in, in, in large measure but regionalism, the desire to have autonomy and control over resources. I mean, at present, the regions collect money in taxes, send it all to Moscow, and then Moscow decides how much they'll get back. They don't have an independent taxation uh, ability, and most of them want exactly that. They would like to have money that they, they make the decision on how much to tax and then how to spend. That's a huge issue. We simply... Uh, go around talking about how there are all these these the small number of donor uh, regions and a much larger number uh, of uh, recipients of, of impoverishment without without recognizing that you have no federalism in Russia. Federalism is 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 in the name of the country. It's required by the constitution, and it doesn't exist otherwise. And I think that that is a huge task especially a country which is as big as the, so, as the Russian Federation is. It, you can't run everything from Moscow, although Vladimir Putin clearly intends to try. And the, the thing is, the effort, the only way that you have any hope of running the place from a single center is to run it like a police state. Unless you have local and regional governments that have control, much greater control over the spending, raising and spending of money and are responsive to the populations in their areas, you will have a, a, a situation in Russia which will drift or more rapidly move in the direction of authoritarianism. And then we will have authoritarianism uh, ble bleeding over into aggressiveness abroad. So I think we need to, to understand that the ethnic issue is critical. I've spent my life studying it. I better not say it's irrelevant, but it, it, a bigger question now is regionalism. Sometimes that has an ethnic dimension as in Tatarstan or Bashkortostan, uh, 
but <laughs> mostly if you're going to look at the drivers of uh, change in Russia, it's going to come from the regions, from regions not wanting to be treated like poor relations, but by having control of their own resources. The United States, which is the longest standing and arguably most effective federal system in the world, ought to be concerned about federalism elsewhere. This federalism has generally worked well for us. And I think that federalism is the only thing that will work for a country the size and diversity of the Russian Federation. Thank you. We're, we're running out of time. We're not gonna get to all the questions uh, that have been coming in, but I wanna, uh, I'll, I'll try and working my way through here. A question is, do you fear coordinated military action between President Xi in China and Putin in Russia against both Taiwan and Ukraine to avoid perceived Ukrainian weak or US weakness? Can US cope with action on, two, on the two states in different geographic areas? I think I would, if I could, I'll just say very quickly, I don't think you've got so much coordination of Russia and China, but Chinese exploitation of the situation. That's not the same thing. I think that the, the Russians want to break windows. The Chinese are only too happy to pick up the pieces as long as they're not blamed. They're, they have a long-term goal of, of pursuing dominance, which doesn't require them to, to break, to break to break windows because they have no other ability to project power. So if China does move against Taiwan, it will be to exploit a situation that may arise if there's a broader war against Ukraine than as a result of coordinated policy between Moscow and Beijing. And I think we should understand that, that it's a risk, the, the risk of, of, of a Chinese move but it is not because there's been a coordination uh, between Beijing and Moscow over when it should happen. Yeah, I agree with that. I'll just add two other quick points. China will watch very carefully how we react uh, if Putin does move uh, further into Ukraine. So our reaction will be very important. Uh, we also have different relationships with Ukraine from the one we have with Taiwan, uh, where we have some defense obligations, although there's strategic ambiguity when it comes to the issue of Taiwan, but the general consensus is that we would come to Taiwan's defense. Uh, President Biden, I think, rather regrettably, explicitly said we would not uh, respond militarily. I I'm not arguing for a military response, but I don't think it was necessary for the President of the United States to telegraph to Putin what our limitations are. Uh, that removes one uncertainty that I would rather leave Putin wondering about, um, but, but we don't have treaty obligations with Ukraine since Ukraine is, is not uh, yet, and I do underscore the word yet, I hope it will be a member of NATO. Yeah. Another question, what is the position, and this is for you, Paul, you've, you've kind of dealt with this, but what is the position of the Russian elite beyond Putin's inner circle uh, on invading Ukraine? Do they want it? Do they back Putin only as long as he is perceived as in complete control? Well, the Russian elite is a very varied entity. Uh, there are some people who will back Putin because they think that's the only only hope they have. But there are members of the elite who are very worried about what will happen to them if Vladimir Putin moves in Ukraine and their responses in the West that deprive them of access of their houses and apartments and wealth uh, in, the, in, in the West and their children who are also in Western educational institutions. So it's not, it's not as if there's a 100% support for Putin uh, in the elite. If he starts, if he begins to expand the invasion, and if there is a really tough Western response, even at the sanctions level, and I think there are lots of things we should be doing a lot tougher than that, but never mind. Even if it's limited to that, there will be members of the Russian elite arguing against further expansion, lest it come down and hurt their bottom lines. And I think that that's we need to understand the Russian elite is not homogeneous. There, there's not, there's nothing, there's, it, it was always diver, more diverse than we gave it credit for being. But right now there are some people in the Russian elite 
who think they have no choice but to go along with Putin no matter what he does. There are others who think we'll see what happens. And there are others who are already worried about what being a, a besieged fortress means for their prospects and the prospects of their children. I don't, I don't think we're talking yet about a revolutionary situation, but I very much believe that if large members of the security elite decide that Putin is harming their interests, their economic and uh, 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 family interests, that there will be resistance that he will have to he will have to deal with, and I think we should be openly looking for that, and within limits celebrating it when it when it begins to appear. There is another thing, however, that needs to be remembered. There's another part of the Russian elite which may be playing an opposite role. Vladimir Putin, twice in this in the last twelve months, has moved large numbers of Russian troops up to the Ukrainian border. The first time he pulled them back. To pull them back a second time will have consequences for the judgments of this of the Russian security elite that may not be what we would like. Putin may feel he, that he is being pushed in the direction of moving more into Ukraine. I don't doubt that that's what he wants, but that he may feel that he has that he has good reason to do it because he could face problems at home among the Siloviki if he doesn't. And so I, 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 the elite is a very mixed bag. It's not, it's not united. The people are not united. This is a very diverse place. And the image of Russia as some kind of monolithic state, which is what Vladimir Putin would like, is nonsense and should be, should be described as that. Yeah, I would just add what, what I don't think we have keen insight on is who has Putin's ear. Um, based on the actions that we're seeing, the behavior and the rhetoric, it seems like the hardliners who want to move um, are, are having a greater influence than those who would act as more of a force of restraint. Um, but I agree with Paul, this, this is not monolithic. There are, but there are people who are going to be badly affected depending on what Putin does. Um, and and I, I also agree that there are only so many times you can build up forces along the border and not send them in. It's, it's the winter now, and conditions are not exactly ideal for the Russian forces. Not that I uh, have a lot of empathy for them, but uh, sitting along the border, um, they did it in the spring. They're doing it again. Uh, third time, you know, we'll, we'll see if we fall for it, if, there, if it doesn't happen this time. Uh, here's here's a question I'm going to get in before we have to end. What is the current status of the party of regions, uh, what the person would call the, the communist party like, uh, as far as influence over Ukrainian politics? What's your opinion of any current Kremlin influence within that party? That party is no longer all that important. The regions are very important, but not not so much through that particular party. I think that the regional, uh, the regional differences on Ukraine are very large. If you look at questions of uh, fulfillment of the draft, this latest cycle, you'll see differences among regions, which is one measure of uh, how much, uh, what regions think about what's going on. The regions who are being starved by Putin's policies are overwhelmingly not happy about more military aggression because it means they don't get the money they need to solve their problems. Uh, again, the fact that we tend to report on and view all of this from Moscow's perspective means we ignore the fact that the person that, who heads a region where there are no longer any hospitals because Putin has closed them to spend money on troops against Ukraine uh, isn't going to be terribly thrilled when large numbers of his people are dying, getting sick and dying without medical help, as is true in many places in Russia now. And so those people are opposed in, in lots of ways. Standing up and saying, I don't want us to go into Ukraine, it's not something that, that is uh, politically or even physically healthy in a place like Russia under Vladimir Putin. But happiness and support and enthusiasm for what he's doing, it's not there in the regions in lots of regions now. Um, 
What, what's, what's your prognosis for an overall invasion of Ukraine, or will Russia continue hitting and attacking in small regional incursions? Well, my own personal view is that Vladimir Putin plans to seize the land bridge uh, to Crimea. That he plans to take the watershed so that he can control, uh, guarantee water supply to Crimea. And that he's counting on the fact that many in Washington and even more in Berlin will see that as an acceptable, as unfortunate, but an acceptable and understandable Russian action and will not take any tough line. Then he will wait and he will move further, but not, but in my opinion, not right now. That I, th I think we're going to see a limited incursion, which is nonetheless an invasion. And it's part of a broader strategy that he has adopted over the last decade. And let, if he, if he isn't, if he isn't stopped now, we will find ourselves in a less advantageous position to defend and oppose what he is doing, both in terms, both in military security terms in Ukraine itself, and in terms of our ability to have influence and be credible in our reporting to the people of the Russian Federation. I guess I would just say uh, the the rhetoric coming out of the Kremlin and other Russian officials seems to be they, they seem almost to be talking themselves into this, um, and I worry about that. Not that they would back themselves in a corner they can't get out of. I, I, based on Putin's control of the situation, I think he could get out of any situation. They can paint any scenario in a positive way as a victory for them. But, but the rhetoric is becoming increasingly bellicose. The demands are, I think, increasingly outrageous. I used to be at about 50-50 on a reinvasion. I'm now at about 75-25 or even 80-20. Um, and let's also remember, um, uh, my friend George Kent reminded me that they deny that they invaded in 2014. So of course they'll deny uh, when they reinvade uh, in 2022 or whenever it may be. Um, so we also have to be prepared for, for that, too. Well, we have, we've gone past our time. I do, I want to make one comment, and you can comment on it uh, with a lightning round. But, you know, Paul, at the beginning, uh, you were talking human rights, among other things. And whether we are talking about a war against Ukraine or we're talking about incursions, we are also talking about human lives. And it, uh, that whole, the whole dynamic of the human rights violations that are involved in all of this really needs to be, I mean, talked about more. I mean, it, it's not a chess game. These are lives we're talking about as well as geopolitics. Having had my little say, lightning round before we sign off, Paul? Here, here. We tend to forget the people and we tend to reduce uh, the, the losses to somehow being chess pieces. They're not. They're someone's fathers, sons, brothers, sisters, wives, and mothers. And we forget that. The people get dropped out of geopolitics awfully quickly, uh, not just in Moscow, but in many other places. Putting them back into that picture here is the first step toward putting, back in, putting them back into the picture in Moscow. And that's one of the ways that we can improve our chances of checkmating Vladimir Putin against an invasion of Ukraine, a further Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yeah, I, I, these aren't statistics. They're, they're human beings whose friends and family are going to be terribly affected and have been terribly affected. And uh, I think uh, President Zelensky was right in his tweet yesterday that there are no minor incursions in small countries um, that this the, these have costs um, in human lives and we have to always bear that in mind. We'll be with you in just a second. Uh, with that, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. We got to a good for If people want to uh, send the questions, I will get them to Paul and, and uh, David. But I thank you, David and Paul, so very much for being with us. I thank our audience. And uh, this is a discussion that maybe we'll have again, because it's uh, certainly uh, 
of great interest to everybody. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Um, try not to be depressed. Try and be optimistic. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.